on to the So good morning. So Dr. Mergel, can I have you go ahead? You've got your screen up. And as I said, these documents will be shared afterwards, as well as on our website for anyone else to, to review. I'd like us to get through if we could in a half hour, possibly if more is needed with questions, we can readily do this. So Dr. Mergel, let's begin. Yes, so thank you, Elsie. It's good to see you, Pat and Janelle. It's been a while since I've seen you, like about six weeks, so it's really good to see you. Um, so I, you guys, we've um, shared with you uh, the big overview of Chapter 55 document, um, and um, I just, just want to share with you kind of uh, the highlights of this document and certainly give you time, and if you have questions about this document and want to get back to us later this week, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to answer any questions once you have kind of more time to kind of dig into it. But what you'll see in this document document is really a um, kind of a historical context of uh, chapter 55, uh, a summary of the research and review activities that occurred with um, chapter 55 prior to going to um, a task force and prior to going to a negotiated rulemaking committee. Um, and then you'll see kind of like the conceptual framework of the guiding concepts to the changes that you'll see in red lines at the end of the document. Um, we've also included in here um, who the task force members were in the negotiated rulemaking. So you'll see here's just kind of an outline of the introduction at the start there of kind of the historical context of um, that accreditation standards have been in place since 1947, making it a pioneer document for really our schools here in Montana and a really important chapter that lays the groundwork for much of the work that we do um, in terms of school quality. Um, the, the 1967 accreditation standards um, really were defined and are kind of still um, guiding a lot of the work um, in the current standards that you see. So um, you'll see here's the timeline, you guys, of kind of this entire process. So research actually began in August of 2019 when um, our partners from the Comprehensive Center in Region 17 commissioned a research report um, and put together kind of a, a, a full view of Montana's accreditation system in comparison to the federal accountability system. They also did some other research to kind of look at every single rule within chapter 55 to say, is that really an input standard? Is an output standard that can actually be measured? And what they found is it's built on a lot of out inputs and very, very little outputs and outcomes um, that are used to actually measure school quality. Um, and we went into um, then a group here at the agency with the Region 17 Comprehensive Center, um, really from uh, that entire time up until about November of 2021. And then we, um, the superintendent put together a task force to kind of guide and begin some of the preliminary work and touch around what they thought would be some important information for her on recommendations for her to consider um, prior to putting that forward to the negotiated rulemaking committee. That group did come together and really kind of looked at eight of the individual 58 different standards that are currently in um, the accreditation with 50 remaining that needed to be, to be looked at where there wasn't much input from that task force. So then the superintendent put her recommendations to the negotiated rulemaking committee who started their work in February and will have its last meeting this Friday on the um, 15th. So we're looking forward to that. Um, in terms of how we're doing, we're at 98% um, have reached consensus on uh, the rules, all the individual rules within chapter 55. We have two remaining um, of the, we have 58 that were currently in rule that, that need, um, that the superintendent put recommendations forward. Eight of those, there was no changes. So that, I mean, 12 of those, sorry, 12, there were no changes. And then we added five new ones. So we're, we're moving forward, we're down to two, which is pretty exciting to be thinking about when you're thinking about 63 total, and we've got 61 where we've reached consensus on. So um, we're down to the ratios for library media specialist and um, the counselor um, 
ratio component. So, um, but I just wanted to kind of share with you the timeline. Then what happens is this, this will be going to the Board of Public Ed in August. Um, this information will be there to them. We've already put out um, economic impact surveys. Um, the negotiated rulemaking committee did uh, determine which of these individual 63 rules they felt needed to be placed on that survey uh, to send out to stakeholders to see um, if there was an impact economically from their perspective. And so we did send that out to over 20,000 people um, and we received over 650 results um, for the first survey that we sent out and then about 150 for the second survey that we sent out on two, two individual questions that the committee had decided they wanted uh, to seek and place on that survey. So we um, are finalizing that and we'll be reviewing that with the committee on this upcoming Friday. So that then you guys will go to the Board of Public Ed, that economic impact statement, along with this document that you're looking at here with whatever the finalized recommendations are um, on those final two. Um, and then the board is hosting a meeting in August uh, to take a look at the economic impact statement and this overview document, which they then have to um, prepare and finalize uh, to get to the Ed Interim Committee in September. So in September, then um, that economic impact statement has to be reviewed by the Ed Interim Committee. So, um, and then from there is really when the MAPA process begins after all of that is determined um, with the goal of implementing this in July, 2023. So if you think about that timeline there, um, we'll be looking at probably January of 2023 of the process beginning under MAPA. Um, so you guys, let, Julie, let me have yes. you stop right there. Thank you. Yes. Are there any questions? I see that Representative Wendy Boy has just joined us. And uh, Representative Wendy Boy, you have your hand up. Is there a question you might ask of us? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent. Uh, I see that there is a uh, report that uh, the lady said that was going to be <clears throat> going to be uh, presented to the education committee in September. And I was wondering, is there any chances since this uh, economic financial uh, impact thing is, uh, it just seems like that economic finance would, would uh, kind of fit under the um, uh, budget side of it. And is the EIBC going to be uh, updated on any of this stuff? Representative, of course, uh, our purpose is to be as transparent with this process. If you can see on the screen here, we've got uh, the opportunity of a timeline and we're pretty much adhered to this timeline. I mean, it's, it's amazing that with all the work that's been happening, we're here. We should have everything to the Board of Public Ed for them to review in that middle uh, aspect of it between uh, the time that the committee finishes. We do know that, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we do know that, and I have Mr. McCracken on the phone or on this Zoom as well. We have uh, the next interim committee, I believe, on the uh, 13th is doing their business of September 13th. The 12th, I believe, is the constitutional discussion. The IBC then is the 14th where you participate. And I would be more than happy to volunteer Dr. Mergel to be able to give this presentation in a very uh, collapsed framework so that you would also be able to see. What I'm excited about this, this economic impact statement and everything is from a bill that I did in 15 to make sure that anything that occurred with accreditation that mandated and demanded of schools, that it had a reflection with a finance or a policy committee. I know there's also work on this bill that might happen this next session to really hone it in a little bit more to know when it goes to and who it goes to. So representative, a quick yes for you. You'll be having information flow on the 14th. Pad, would you like to share anything more to that? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to um, clarify, the Ed Interim Committee will meet on Monday the 12th, Great. and the constitutional players will gather on Tuesday the 13th, and then the EIBC on Wednesday the 14th. I think that 
it, I think you had Monday and Tuesday flipped. I did. Thank you, Pat. I just know that week is very busy. Plus, also toward the end of the week, we have on the 15th and the 16th of September, we have the Board of Public Ed as well. And I believe that we also have the Board of Regents in, in meeting as well. It's Yeah, it's one of those fun weeks. Dr. Mergel, anything else that you would like to go ahead and share if there are no other questions? No, I think that um, as you look through the document, I would just key folks into, you'll see the research on here. But when you get down here to, um, and you know, um, this conceptual framework really is a great um, place to go to, to really understand the changes and the rationale uh, for why the changes below that are redlined have been put forward. So for example, you'll just see there that we've remodeled the continuous school improvement plan to an integrated action plan to really align all the different plans that school districts are required to put forward um, and to really kind of utilize that from the Board of Trustees strategic planning to all of the different federal program plans to the CSIP um, plan into one big integrated action plan. And so that's the recommendation there. So as you look at this document and wanna kind of dig in a little bit more, this table up front is probably the most helpful tool that kind of gives you an idea of the rationale and the thinking that connects the research to the superintendent's recommendations down to um, where consensus was formed with the committee. Uh, if you will. So you'll think, see things here in bold. Those really are the areas that um, have really been emphasized throughout there in these conceptual changes. So then when you get down here to the red line and you can start to see what it looks like, um, for example, that one on the um, action plan, you'll see on the left-hand column, the current rule, the middle column is the redlined recommendations that the committee did reach consensus on. As I had mentioned, as you scroll down, there are two that are highlighted in yellow. The reason why those are highlighted in yellow, again, that's um, 1055, 709, and 710. That's because the committee is um, uh, still in negotiations for those two particular pieces. I'll just scroll down there really quick. For, um, uh, and our meeting on those this Friday. So you'll see that in yellow. Um, that means that that's the one part of this document that will change depending on where the committee lands on um, consensus there. Um, and then these will go back to the superintendent. And like I said, so everything else that's in white, not highlighted, that means that the committee has reached consensus on that. And those um, are the finalized individual components of that. So when you get down here, you'll see yellow. Sorry, I'm scrolling so quick. Um, so that's kind of an overview, guys, of, you know, the process that we've used, the timeline, those conceptual understandings, and then here's the red line. Like I said, the committee will be finalizing their economic impact statement this Friday as well. So just thank you, Dr. Mergel. A couple highlights is uh, the consolidation and streamlining. So when ESSA came into play after No Child Left Behind went away, they, it was demanded there be, there be plans of school improvement. And we looked at our accreditation there, and this was before the pandemic, uh, to see how we could do some consolidation and streamline what schools have to report. And I believe that this methodology that the Negotiating Rulemaking Committee has come up with is making sure that that collapse of plans is strategic and there is not less work at the, um, at the school or the district level, but it's more integrated work. And that means then that they have a definite understanding they submit a plan. And that plan is consistent with with everything that the state has required, as well as what the federal government has required. The thing that is interesting with this are also those ESSER plans. And these are the, the federal COVID relief monies that are very transparent. Um, they are not necessarily rolled up in this because accreditation is longstanding. And ESSER dollars, as we know, ESSER one must be spent that 41 million by uh, October one of this year. ESSER two of the 770 million must be spent by 23 October and ESSER the last 300 million must be spent 
um, by 24. So we're trying to roll up and be as streamlined as possible. The other thing that's quite interesting with what the negotiating rulemaking committee has come up with is the uh, graduate profile. And in our school systems across our state, we have K-12 districts. We have uh, districts that are only K-8. So to have a graduate profile requested of all schools means that there needs to be a clear understanding of when a student enters in at possibly the age of three in special education, what does that mean then for them to be able to cross the stage in their world? to be able to be a graduate. So we're looking at completion by the time they come into school, which I believe is uh, very interesting. This came out of the negotiating rulemaking committee's uh, thinking. So embracing innovation has been a uh, part of the negotiating rulemaking. The two that are left, which is, uh, which is counseling, as well as with um, our librarians, the focus is on two things. One, being able to flexibly hire in any manner, shape, or form. Rather, before it was if you were a larger school, you had to employ rather than be able to contract or work in a consortium. We have broken down those barriers, and the Negotiating Rulemaking Committee, I believe, is at that point of accepting that, um, that ability to hire. What is left for them is to determine that the ratio of a counselor um, is not is is not the uh, the main priority. In other words, it's not that you hire or check the box. It is making sure that you have a program with a counselor in uh, mental health awareness, as well as embracing family, as well as in career readiness. So that plan then, that, that counseling plan, that library plan, making sure that there's literacy digital as well as um, all kinds of things, increasing our reading abilities within our schools, that plan will also be rolled up into that initial plan that I spoke about. So making sure then that counselors are used within our schools and they are licensed Montana counselors, making sure that we have licensed librarians uh, and a library program with a counseling program is the highlight of what is being left at this point. I'm very proud of the Negotiating Rulemaking Committee. Um, they are on our website. If you wanted to look at any of the um, Zoom or any of the in-person, we've been utilizing the, the, the Capitol and uh, the great uh, spaces that they have up there. The last one, because it's a very busy meeting this week, will be held in uh, the budget office, Capitol Room, second floor, um, right off the rotunda there. And these are all, uh, how do I say, recorded, so they're very much for transparency. So I know I've done a lot of speaking. Representative Windy Boy, you had a question? Well, I don't, yeah, I, I guess, you know, just, uh, I missed out a lot of this stuff. This is the first time I, uh, I tuned into this chapter 55 uh, deal. I have a couple of questions. Number one, uh, this chapter 55, I understand there's a section in there that, uh, that provides for, um, for uh, some type of a school choice type of language in that. And the second question is, goes then to, uh, if that was, if that's the case, then uh, has there been any, uh, Native American uh, school teachers, counselors, or whatever participation in this whole process. Dr. Mergel, I'll let you answer. Sure, thank you, uh, Representative Wendy Boy. Um, on the uh, committee, we have had tribal representatives, uh, Representative Corey Barron has been uh, present at each of those negotiations as part of the committee. Um, and so um, that's definitely been a piece. But to answer your question about the choice, let me pull my screen back up, um, Representative, so I can show you exactly uh, what I think you are talking about. Um, this is under uh, the, the variance to standard, which is in 605. So let me go there. Um, it's currently living in current rule. Um, it's called a charter school, Representative Windy Boy. Um, 
And it's currently under variance to standard as number 11. So I'm just scrolling up there so I don't scroll on the screen to you guys. I just want to pull it up so that you can actually see what I'm talking about here, Representative. While you're doing that, has there been any uh, changes on that piece during this part process? Um, a couple of, of pieces on there, yes. So when you go to 604, I'm going to share this right now. Can you guys see that okay? Did that just jump? Oh my goodness, sorry. Sorry, you guys. As soon as I shared my screen, it jumped on me. So when you're doing all of this stuff and everything, is there, <clears throat> since this uh, rulemaking is all going on, what is the uh, time frame for? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Representative. What, what is the uh, time frame for public comment and all of that stuff go take place? Is that the same 30-day open window? Um, that'll take place after it gets to the board, uh, Representative, and um, that'll be after September when the MAPA process will actually begin. Um, so it'll go there and it will be, um, uh, you know, a notice will be put out and it'll be open for uh, public comment for the amount of time that it needs to be. There'll be a public comment hearing. Um, and then they'll go through that whole process before adoption. And so that probably will take place in January of 2023 with the, um, uh, with the goal of implementation in July of 2023. Sounds good. Uh, so uh, is it possible, uh, doctor, then can you forward all this information to me? Absolutely. And um, Jonathan, I also put in the chat there, there's a link to the OPI webpage that has all of the recordings, minutes, agendas, and all of these documents as well. So if you um, find anything on there you want to talk about more, we're happy to, to kind of go through that with you. But your question about the accreditation process, Jonathan, is under variance to standards, um, and that had been moved out to create its own standard. Um, and so that was under the variance of standard number 11, and we um, transitioned that into its own category. Um, and so you'll see it right in here. It used to be number 11 under 1055-604, where um, a school district could request a charter school um, and go through the process with the variance to standards board here. Um, we've taken that and separated that out to be its own standard. Um, and so um, that's in 700s now. Um, one of the things that we really emphasized in there was um, for a charter school that they could seek um, any of um, the uh, variances basically to the assurance standards. Um, but they would have to meet or exceed expectations for student performance standards. Um, and it would go through the same process. It's very similar to what's here in 11, but it's been brought into its own um, so that it really kind of um, doesn't just fall under number 11, where it was kind of confusing on then, did that mean they had to identify every component of the assurance standards or could they seek um, basically a charter application for all of those with the agreement of what they would achieve for the student performance standards? So I do believe, Representative Wendy Boyd, that that would be a very important piece. I know for many of the schools looking to create the language and culture immersion schools, um, this would be a great opportunity, I think, uh, for us to take a look at them potentially applying for something like this. Um, through a local yeah, and that, school board. And, and that, yeah, and that's what I, th and, and that's, that, that was a point I'm getting at because mm -hmm. I think in order for, uh, I'm, I'm trying to look at under the, the existing laws of uh, Senate bills 342 and 13 and 272 and 15, it seems like we, we do have the, uh, the uh, laws in place 
It's just a matter of trying to encourage uh, local districts or or uh, local jurisdictions to to go to that next step. And I think that just from my own experience with this lawmaking process, why I'm asking so many of these questions because in these rulemaking uh, negotiations, whatnot, all I, all I go in there is a bunch of suits and ties of lawyers and everything that's making these changes. And uh, that's why I want to make sure that there are there there's some people of uh, that's in the trenches that make the difference because they're the, at the end of the day they're the ones that's going to be uh stuck with all of this work mm -hmm. yep yep very true that seems to be a piece jonathan that's been throughout some of this is uh, we're finding there's a lot of flexibility uh, within these rules and how do we really ensure that people are aware of them and leveraging those opportunities <laughs> And so where we could really okay. highlight that, it was really important to do so. So you so just to make sure that I got that right, that's 10-55-604 that has that uh, charter school language. Yeah, and it was number 11 and now has been moved, Jonathan, to, I believe, let me hold on here. I'm going to scroll here for a second I'm, um, and I'll hopefully pull it back up on the screen. Um, did you get sorry, Jonathan no, no. this? Did you get this overview document in the email last night? I, I got something. I didn't get a chance. I okay. So when you go, much stuff they get swamped. <laughs> I can only imagine. I'm not envious of that at all. Um, so when you go in there um, and you take a look, uh, you'll be able to find that um, moved into its own standard, if you will. Um, uh, so it's removed from 60411 and is now at 60, I believe, 6, Jonathan. I, Julie, Dr. Murgle, I'm this is Pat. I'm seeing it on page 43 of your document at 608. 608, thank you. So and, page 43, thank you, Pat. Yeah, and and as I'm kind of scrolling through that, and, and just to clarify and follow up on Representative Wendy Boy's questions, that the language about charter schools has been relocated and slightly modified. Is that accurate? That is accurate, Pat. Um, it has been relocated to, to, set to 608 into its own standard, as we talked about, as it's already there and it's been there, but this kind of allows it to be highlighted so folks can really um, uh, maybe see it more, maybe bring more familiarity, and then just a little bit of tweak or change, if you will, Pat, around ensuring that they understand that they'll be held accountable for student outcomes. The performance standards. Mm -hmm. For the performance standards. Okay, yes. and one thing I'll point out, Julie, is on this document that Brian shared last night, um, I'm, I'm looking then at page well, the next page, it seems like the red lining ends in the middle of the new language. And so I think what I'm going to do is get myself a version of existing rule and a version of the new proposed rule and get them side by side so I can see exactly what's been modified, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yep. And you can see it up there. If um, I could also move that if that would be helpful. That's a good note to make um, where it was at in 60. Four number eleven is up above in the left hand column. This would yeah. probably be the only one pad where they're not side by side because it's been moved. Hey, uh, Elsie, real quick, like as Representative Windy Boy, I have a uh, person on staff here. Her name is uh, Jay Eagle. Man has been closely watching this stuff. He has a question, like throw at you. So I need clarification on on this question. Um, does it take the school district to make the request for a charter school? Or could that be a matter of, uh, like, say, a, a concerned citizen wanting an alternate uh, academic environment? Could that same individual, or in this case, um, could the tribe make such a request? That's where we want to go. Thank you so much. Good to hear your voice. Uh, Dr. Mergel, if you want to answer that. Yeah, so Representative Windy Boy, um, really good, important question. So yes, a school district would um, 
with approval of their board of trustees apply to the superintendent of public instruction and the board of public ed for a charter school. So it does go through the local school board. And, and that goes back to the point about the, uh, the fact finding mission that we've been on. And it seems like the tribes have been kind of left out the loop on this whole thing. Like is like, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of asinine in a way to, to, to see how this process is working with that. Because when you take a look at it, when you take a look at Rocky Boy and Box Elder Schools, for example, we're in a, a mid to upper uh, yes. 90 percentile uh, student population. And, uh, and, 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 for, and for the tribe to not have any type of participation or oversight of their own um, constituents, in a minority state uh, age range, you know we're kind of we're kind of kind of uh, looking at this backwards. That's the reason why I, I'm, we're throwing all these questions out there because of the participation from the tribes on the, on a public education and that, and when they're when the schools report to the tribe, they they come in there with rosy pictures. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything we don't need anything mm -hmm. changed. But in reality, knowing what we're discovering in this last year is totally goes against what we're hearing. And that's the reason why I want to make sure that these uh, this public comment is heard. And I sure hope that, uh, Elsie, I hope you take in consideration all of those reports that I've submitted quarterly that uh, I've been reporting. Thank you, Representative. Of course, I um, <laughs> want you to understand this process. So the Negotiating Rulemaking Committee move this into its own rule to really brighten and show the flexibilities that are there. This process then goes to the Board of Public Ed to take a look at to see if indeed there needs to be any other amendments to my recommendations. So anything that you're talking about at this point could be changed or strengthened in the manner of the process before it goes through the public comment. I also want to share with you, Representative, Senate Bill 34 in Alaska was just passed, <clears throat> excuse me, was just passed. And um, it, I believe uh, the last discussion I had was in March with them. This is having the tribe uh, be the authorizers for five pilot schools yeah. for charter. I don't know if you have done any research. Pad, I know we've been looking at this bill to see what the authority and the autonomy could be within all the work that uh, Representative Wendy Boy's group has been working in language and, and preservation and making sure that there is some autonomy. But Senate Bill 34 in Alaska might be showing some pathway to what that might be that the representative is requesting. Okay, any other further questions that anyone might have toward today's discussion? I said I wanted about a half hour. I know time is very precious. Julie, let's talk about these documents. The one you show up on the screen, uh, there'll be other documents because we've got the economic survey. If you would like to share the, the pathway that we have, and there might be some things in chat if you would like to uh, answer any of those questions as well. Hey, I'll see real quick while well, it's fresh on my mind. Can I throw one more? I'm sorry about interrupting. Sure. But, uh, you know, with this whole uh, process of consultation that's under these other uh, different title uh, funding sources, one, two, three, four, impact aid, all of those things there, there's, uh, there's a uh, consultation piece under uh, Article 10, Section 8 that specific specifies that consultation with the, uh, with the tribes, the tribal governments, how does that fit in here? Is, is that process been handled? Yes, sir. I'll let Dr. Mergel speak a little bit more in, in depth. So Representative Windy Boy, absolutely. Uh, tribal consultation is part of uh, the federal by ESA that was uh, reauthorized ESEA, the Elementary Secondary uh, School Act. There is a piece under there about tribal consultation that's within there. Um, that is the role that Donnie Wetzel plays here is to be um, coordinating tribal consultation between the tribes and the school boards and the superintendents, if you will. Um, and so 
Um, that's certainly a piece that we've been working to strengthen uh, through the past uh, couple of years as he stepped into that role. We actually um, created that position uh, for that very purpose. Thank you, Representative. So Dr. Merkel, just share with us for this path and what other documents we might have. Yeah, so I did put in the chat, you guys, the link there to the um, website at the OPI that does house all of chapter 55. Um, so you can certainly go there and see any of the documents that we have here. We'll be posting as soon as we complete this week on Friday, any of the final superintendent's recommendations, um, finalize the economic impact statement, um, and that will be going to the board, but we'll be posting that information on our website. So if you wanna get further information, and then I do encourage you to uh, be uh, looking for that special meeting in August with the Board of Public Ed, where they will be um, discussing where the superintendent's recommendations will be shared and this economic statement will be shared. Um, and then it turns over to them to begin that process to the Ed Interim Committee. So um, we look forward to these transitions of these documents and please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at the OPI if you have any questions at all. Thank you, Julie. I just want to share that um, I'm very, very pleased. I know, Pad, I think you were uh, in your first year as staffer when we did our first process with uh, the old law to find how much substantial impact there might be on anything dealing with accreditation. And we had to go out three times to even get 100. Dr. Mergel, how many people in total with the two surveys that we've gone out on the 12 possible rules that the negotiating committee has said that there may be uh, an economic impact. How many have responded? We had about 800. Yes. And um, when we look yes. at chapter 55, uh, previously, Elsie, in the most recent, um, uh, in 2019, for the hazards report and the, um, the student performance standards in 2019, when they went out on that, um, there was a more of a narrow group of people that the economic impact statement was shared with. We really tried to be more broad and encompass to get more stakeholders invited to that, to really provide their perspective from all roles that are represented, represented on the committee. And then um, they had only like a turn rate of like 16 and 17. Um, so we're close to 800. So we look at about um, 650 from the first one and 150 from the second one. So. Yeah, so we're, we're very pleased to have gotten a lot of different perspective from all of our stakeholders. I appreciate it. Any further questions you might have of Dr. Mergel or myself? Uh, Elsie, is Jonathan again? Yes. Sorry for, ta sorry for taking up all the time here, but I'm, you know me, I'm full of questions. Um, okay, it goes, goes back, the question goes back to the point of consultation that we mentioned on that uh, uh, Article 10, Section 8. So. When you when when Donnie is going out there, on what level of disclosure is he uh, displaying to the tribal councils? Is it like, uh, say, for the example that the forty million that uh, the ESSA dollars has come down, divided up into the four hundred school districts or whatever? Um, are they going to come down? For example, Rocky Boy, when he comes down here on July twenty sixth at eleven a.m., is he going to come with the numbers? Okay, this is how much money that Rocky Boy School got. This is how much money a Box Elder School got. <clears throat> this is the consultation that you're going to have, or is it just going to be kind of a um, sky level area view of uh, presentation? Thank you, Representative. Um, I believe we can get a little bit more in detail, but our entire purpose with the tribal consultation is to make sure we follow the law, the federal law. And the other aspect of this is, in my philosophy, is not to do things to, but to do things with. And I believe that granular approach is really important. It's not so much about the money of us sharing, here's your money. We want to know and we want to understand better the uses of the dollars. And I think that's where that consultation is in a conversation rather than being uh, a one-way one -way street. So, but I know that tribal consultation can happen in many, many different ways. Um, and it, it depends on each tribe as well of who wants to be at that table. And, 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 that's, and, that's, and I appreciate that comment because 
what we what what I've, what we've discovered here recently <clears throat> is that uh, giving the example of impact aid, <clears throat> and I'm going to beat a dead horse here on this one here. Rocky Boy gets 14.1 million, Box Elder gets 8 million. That's 22.1 million. That and the uh, every time every year the school um, district and the and the administrators come forward and request a waiver, which Rocky Boy Tribal Council has been waiving for the last 30 years or so. And the thing about it is that not once have they explained to them that once you waive this, you have no authority or uh, ability to question the Indian public uh, policies and procedures that could be in place that some of the school districts, other places are. And and that's why I say that at some point at, the, at some point in time, I think that uh, whether it be Donnie or somebody else in there that need to explain to the tribal councils, okay, this is what's this is what's happening with the waiver process on some of these monies, and uh, this is what needs to happen because this is what you're waiving. This policy procedures is what uh, is what's what's not what's not going to be thrown out the window if you if you waive this whole thing. And so it's, it's that whole it's that whole full disclosure of what needs to happen. And I think that uh, you know, time is a good now is a good time than ever to include all of this discussion, to have full disclosure to every tribal council, because as you know, like any politics that uh, faces change, seats change, everything. So, you know, that that's my piece. For I now. agree, I agree. And what's excellent is we have uh, Pad McCracken who is staffing <laughs> state tribal relations. And Pad, has this come up at all? I know, have you journeyed out to the Southeast or are you coming going there soon? Because your purpose with this interim committee was to try to reach as many uh, tribal lands as possible. But do you understand what the representative is asking? Uh, superintendent and yeah, representative Wendy boy has, um, been getting me up to speed on, uh, consultation and its various forms and kind of the status of it with different school districts and tribes. And yes, we are going to Northern Cheyenne and Crow in two weeks. Uh, we'll meet, uh, with the tribes on the 26th and then meet in Billings on the 27th. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm one, I'm wondering, Pat, and it's not that it, I mean, out of budget, it can come out of our budget for sure. But maybe what we do is um, we have Donnie or, or possibly a another individual also from our office go with on this part here, not not to partake as such, but to be listening and to be understanding of what that interplay might look look like. And again, I think it needs to be uniqueness depending on which council we go to, if we speak to the education uh, individual there that each tribe is to have, or if it's the local government as well. So, but I would be happy to offer Donnie up <laughs> and Julie, we would have to make sure that that would happen. Oh, yeah. uh, but I think that might be something very important to do. The other aspect is, we have a group of schools that we call the Mighty Five that are in the bottom ranking that uh, the federal government has mandated us to do, and they are in that region. And that might be something, Julie, as we talked about this morning, is have a team effort rather than have just a siloed group that we can come in together and listen together. Okay, thank you. Well, I appreciate everyone to be part of this. Yes, sir. Elsie, real, real, Elsie, real quick, like you know, um, rather than having your your staff go down just to listen, I mean that's not consultation. They got to, the, your staff needs to explain to the tribal governments that this is it, this is this, this is that, this is what this is what's supposed to happen. Your input, what do you think about what's happening with these rulemaking? I bet you anything that the, the, the majority of the tribal councils haven't even seen the document because I haven't even. Thank you. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I just, because of this meeting is already set and Pat is the one leading this interim committee. I didn't want to take over that interim committee meeting, but I think if we come together with the other legislators as they make this journey, uh, that we can do, uh, we can listen as much as 
share, but I didn't want to overstep my role as state superintendent into the legislative body. Pat has been working very diligently in creating all these things, but Jonathan, you're spot on. And I apologize by calling you by your Christian name, but Jonathan, you are spot on because it is extremely important that uh, we share, hey, that government hold shares. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. For one thing, I'm not Christian, so don't, don't, don't say that to me. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Okay. Anything further? Yeah, I guess, you know, at some point in time that I know you don't want to step on toes, but I think at some point in time, you need to take the bull by the horns, Elsie, and uh, provide this uh, proper consultation that tribes are due. I appreciate it. I know exactly what you're saying. And I thank you for that. What I believe we can do is we can further this discussion off in another role and bring Donnie on and, and our entire team. And that team, of course, has been led by Dr. Mergel. So I think you are perfect to come on to our call today. And Pad, uh, all this information is coming out to you. I don't know how you would like to distribute it to the rest of the Interim Education Committee. Um, this was prior to the 15th when we have the negotiating rulemaking completed, um, and then it'll go to the board. Uh, but we're here to give as much information in the process as possible. I'm going to, I'll distribute that document that Brian shared and also a link to the full chapter 55 webpage. Perfect. Um, so that the ed committee can, can track and make sure that they're clear on what, what will be coming to us and when, and what the committee's role is. You're so kind. Thank you for that. And I see Janelle, we have you on. Is there anything you would like to also share? And I thank you for being part of this discussion with 55. Thank um, you for so your good I'm work. Good. I got my questions answered. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we're here to serve. If there's any questions, uh, this information document will be on our website as much as been going out to any of those that we had sent out. I just also want to share we have an education advocate that we hold every single um, month. It'll be next Tuesday at this very same time where we bring in the congressional delegations, where we bring in all of the advocates, all of the associations from the union to rural, very isolated small schools, um, and we bring private schools together. There will be a little bit more of this discussion at that point as well. But with that, it is a beautiful Tuesday across our state. Let's enjoy our Montana landscape and weather. Please stay well. Blessings. <laughs>